Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. This is Winston. You guys are rocking with us on Mike Intellectual Corner on today's episode. We're diving back into some things in general. This is Cyprus Crisis 1974 Cold War documentary. And without further ado, we're just gonna dive right into it. Like always, let's roll. Well. Cyprus Crisis 1974 meant that it saw constant invasions throughout its history. The Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Franks and the Turks all vied for it. In the second half of the 20th century, the island erupted into another war, with the local and mainland Greeks and Turks fighting a full-scale war in 1974. Welcome to our video on the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, also called the Cyprus Peace Operation voted for by our patrons and YouTube members. If you're interested in the history of this era, don't forget to check out our second channel, The Cold War. The link is in the top right corner. Yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, real quick, let me uh, try to do a, uh, see if I, if I remember this correctly. So if I'm not mistaken, Cyprus, uh, the government of Cyprus wanted to align themselves with the Hellenic um, League, essentially, with um, under Greece. And obviously, um, Turkey did not want any of it, so they went in and decided to, I think they tried, as they called it, a peace keeping a, a situation or something like that. But pretty much, um, yeah, Turkey didn't want that to happen because, um, you know, they're long standing uh, rivalry with Greece and all that stuff. So this happened, and now I think as a result of it today, the northern part of it is controlled by Greece, by Turkey, and the southern half is, is um, you know, Cyprus is still on Cyprus thing, but, you know, it's. If I know what I'm talking about here. Cyprus, a strategic island in the Mediterranean Sea, inhabited by a majority Greek and minority Turkish population, had been ruled by the Ottoman Empire since 1571, up until 1878, when Britain took control over it and formally annexed it in 1914. Cyprus was under British control until 1960, when the island proclaimed its independence. But the process leading to the independence of Cyprus was far from peaceful. Greek and Turkish communities had different plans for the island, and the British had to find a solution which would keep both sides content. Greek Cypriots wanted unification with Greece, Enosis. Their strongest organization was Aoka, which sought to achieve independence from Britain first and then to unify with Greece. Turkish Cypriots wanted the partition of Cyprus between Greece and Turkey, the plan which was called Taksim. The most prominent organization of Turkish Cypriots was TMT. And obviously, uh, I mean, as we, as we know, that's pretty much what happened. They got what they wanted because, like I said, the northern part of it is, or the northern and southern part are two different essentially uh i want to say almost two different entities two different countries essentially but um but yeah let's see. intercommunal greek turkish violence in cyprus was regular in the 1950s to 70s and the constitution of cyprus approved by the zurich agreement between turkey greece and the uk did not bring peace to the island according to the constitution the president of Cyprus was to be a Greek, elected by the Greek community, and the vice president would be a Turk, elected by the Turks. Both of them would have veto power. 30% of the cabinet ministers and state officials would be Turks, and both communities would have high autonomy from each other. The Turkish, Greek and British armies had military bases on the island, and were the guarantors of its independence. Greek Cypriots were unhappy with the privileges provided to Turkish Cypriots, and a number of times in the 1960s, violence erupted. In 1963, the violence resulted in the death of 364 Turkish and 174 Greek Cypriots, the destruction of 109 Turkish Cypriot or mixed villages, and the displacement of 25 to 30,000 Turkish Cypriots. At the time, Turkey was on the brink of invading Cyprus to Honestly it's kinda it's kinda crazy because they, they literally have two of the biggest right almost biggest rivals in the Mediterranean um living on a, an island like that is obviously it, it works for a bad, you know, combination of bad like little soup mix or whatever you want to call it. But you know what I'm saying? Like it's crazy that um I guess the British couldn't of uh well I mean there's I guess not a lot that they could have done. But at the same time, um 
Yeah, it sucks that it couldn't have been handled better, but I mean, there's not a lot you really do with the situation, I feel like. You know. Protect the Turkish population, but a US diplomatic intervention and direct talks between Turkey and Greece calmed tension down a bit. By 1974, the Greek Cypriot leadership under Makarios cooled down on the necessity of Enosis, but Greece, ruled by a military junta, promoted Enosis and cooperated with local pro-Enosis forces such as Aoka. In 1974, the Makarios government was overthrown by Cypriot National Guard elements, led by Greek officers. A vehemently pro-Enosis anti-Turkish member of Aoka, Nikos Samson, was declared the president. Turkey issued a list of demands to Greece via the US negotiator. These demands included the immediate of Nikos Samson, the withdrawal of 650 Greek officers from the Cypriot National Guard, the admission of Turkish troops to protect their population, equal rights for both populations, and access to the sea from the northern coast for Turkish Cypriots. They called on Britain to ensure the neutrality of Cyprus as one of the guarantors. Britain refused, and Turkey started planning an invasion of Cyprus. I mean, honestly, as long as we're with these demands, as long as, like, the, the only one that I see that might have a little issue is just the, the withdrawal of 650 Greek officers. I mean, if they can, I say, in, like, probably cut that number in half and have equal um, numbers, I mean, these aren't that bad of demands if you really think about equal rights for both populations. They're asking for both populations to have that, not just their own. <laughs> At the time, 117,000 Turks were living on the island, mainly in the enclaves in Nicosia, Famagusta, Lanaka, and Limassol. The Turkish Cypriots had a 10 to 13,000 man standing army and were able to mobilize up to 20,000 men. They had control of the strategic Nicosia Kyrenia Highway, which made communication for Greek Cypriots with the north of the island more difficult. The main force of Greek Cypriots on the island was the National Guard, headed by Greek officers, with a standing army of 12,000 men and 32 tanks, having the potential to mobilize up to 40,000 men. Along with that, Aoka had 5,000 men, and the elite Greek regiment Elpik had 1,200 men. The plan of the Turkish army, Attila I, was to land in Kyrenia and secure territories including the Turkish enclave near Nicosia, Gionyele. That would be a demonstration of force, and there was hope that a diplomatic solution would be possible after that. If not, the Turks would press on to secure the northern part of Cyprus up until Famagusta. The Turkish army was confident of success, since they considered themselves to be dominant in the Mediterranean, on sea and in the air. A naval armada of five destroyers and 31 landing ships would carry the amphibious forces, while the air force would drop paratroopers and supplies and provide air support for the entire operation. Turkey deployed 40,000 men and 180 tanks during the confrontation in Cyprus. Greek Cypriots had the Aphrodite plan, which aimed to swiftly attack Turkish enclaves in Cyprus as soon as information about a Turkish invasion arrived, in an attempt to prevent them from connecting with these enclaves. On the 20th of July, 1974, the Kakmak Special Strike Force Landing Brigade, one battalion of the 6th Amphibious Infantry Regiment... I'm surprised we didn't see like a, uh, or I'm sure we probably will in a little bit, but like a blockade from the Turkish um, uh, government so that they don't have, or military so that they don't have any more, um, you know, uh, you know, reinforcements from Greece and stuff, Greece and stuff like that, but who knows, let's see. Because I'm not, um, obviously, uh, at lack of my uh, talking in this time, I'm not 100% sure on the details of this one, so let's see. The 50th Infantry Regiment and one company of the 39th Divisional Tank Battalion, 39th Infantry Division, the whole force consisting of around 3,000 troops and 12 M47 tanks, landed unopposed in Pentamili, a few miles from the main port of Kyrenia. Two Greek Cypriot motor torpedo boats, the T-1 and T-3, attempted to make the landing more difficult for the Turks, but were destroyed on the morning of the landing. The first land attack by Greek Cypriots was made at 10am 
by elements of the 251st Infantry Battalion, supported by five T-34 tanks. The Turks managed to repel the attack, disable all five tanks and advance. An attack by elements of the 281st, 316th and the 286th Battalions led by National Guard Staff Officer Lieutenant Colonel Bufas, initially forced the Turks to retreat, but eventually the Turkish 50th Infantry Regiment was able to regain the lost ground and force the Greeks to dig in. Elsewhere, near Nikosia, by the Turkish enclave Pionyela, the landing of Turkish paratroopers was disastrous, with more than 90 of 120 men losing their lives. 550 men and 20 tanks of Eltik began the siege of Gyonyela, which was a strategic point on the Kyrenia Nikosia road, cutting the island from the north to the south. A little bit more surprised when I seen a little bit more support from their naval vessels, like, you know, and uh, support air cannon and stuff like that. But... Center. Turkish Cypriots were prepared for the siege and heavily fortified the area with defensive and anti tank structures. They were able to repel the initial Greek attack, and the following counterattack by the 399th Battalion inflicted significant damage to the Greek Cypriots, with at least four of their tanks being destroyed in the process. On the 20th of July, the Greek Cypriot forces attacked the Turkish Cypriot enclaves at Limassol, Paphos, and Agaita Nicosia with different levels of success. In Limassol and Paphos, the Turks were defeated and many were taken as prisoners of war. On the same day, the United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 353, demanding all foreign military personnel leave Cyprus and calling on Britain, Turkey and Greece to start negotiations to restore peace on the island. On the 21st of July, Turkish destroyer Kuja Tepe was hit by friendly fire after deception by Greek Cypriots and sunk with all of its 53-person crew. The Greeks also suffered from friendly fire, as approximately 30 commandos died when a Noratlas aircraft transporting them from Crete to Cyprus was hit by Greek Cypriot anti-aircraft guns. The junta in Greece understood that local Greek Cypriot forces were not strong enough to defeat the Turks. The 537th Infantry Battalion, a battalion of tanks, and 500 Cypriot volunteers were sent as reinforcements. In the morning of July 21st, all Turkish enclaves in Limassol and Larnaca were taken by the Greeks. Thousands of Turks were taken as POWs. Other enclaves of Lefka, Denizli, Famagusta, and Limnitis were also under attack. It's a little surprising and at least good that we didn't see Greece or Greece and Turkey actually all out go to war. So obviously we know that they share a border and everything else that could have really turned it ugly. So it's actually really kind of cool to see that they kept it. You know, we're, we're just trying to keep this into a situation type of thing, you know? On July 22nd, the second wave of Turkish forces, including a tank company and a mechanized infantry company, arrived in Cyprus. The Turks attacked Kyrenia, which was defended by 33 MK commando, and the 306th, 251st, and 241st Infantry Battalions. They were able to take the town after losing five tanks. The force which took Karenia was able to establish communications between Karenia and Pionyele. This was an important achievement, as firstly a Turkish enclave in Pionyele was protected, and secondly, controlling Karenia allowed Turkey to send more troops to Cyprus. Greek defeats in the first days of the war led to the collapse of the junta regime in Greece on the 23rd of July. Britain tried to restore peace by organizing negotiations between Greece and Turkey on the 25th of July. These talks went on until August 14th and did not achieve success. Turkey demanded the federalization of Cyprus, allowing the transfer of populations. The new president of Cyprus, Clarides, asked for two days to make a decision, but Turkey demanded an immediate answer and commenced its second wave of offensives on August 14th, Attila II. Two more infantry divisions were transferred to Cyprus. Greek Cypriots organized their defense along the Trudos line, which left 40% of the island accessible to Turkish troops. 
Its western sector started from the sea and went on until the Nicosia airport and was defended by the 11th Tactical Group. The central sector spread from Nicosia International Airport and ended at the suburb of Nicosia, Miamilia. It consisted of the 212th Reserve Battalion, Elbsuk's Camp Detachment, three companies, the 336th Reserve Battalion, reinforced with various companies with a total strength of 1,300 men, the 211th Battalion and the 187th Artillery Battalion. The eastern flank consisted of the 12th Tactical Group and the 9th Tactical Group, and expected the strongest Turkish attack. The total size of the Greek forces numbered at around 20,000 men, with 21 T-34 tanks. Turkish forces consisted of 40,000 men, mainly in the 28th and 39th Infantry Divisions, one armoured regiment, with one tank battalion and one mechanised infantry battalion from the 5th Armoured Brigade, the Turkish regiment on Cyprus, reinforced with one parachute battalion and one battalion from the 50th Regiment, one commando brigade, one paratrooper brigade, 60 to 200 tanks, 200 APCs and 120 field guns. Added to them were the remaining five Turkish Cypriot regiments with 19 battalions. Turkey's target was to connect with Turkish enclaves in Famagusta and Limnitis. Attila II started with the Turkish 39th Division attacking the Miamilia defensive line, defended by the 399th Battalion. The Turks were able to push through, and together with the 241st Battalion, the Greek Cypriots fell back to Famagusta. In the central sector, the Turks were met with heavy resistance and their advance was limited. Honestly, they're really lucky that uh, the Greeks are really lucky that the Turkey, Turks didn't freaking start setting or start bringing in men to, onto their, you know, saying their six o'clock their flanks and shit like that. Because, I mean, it's pretty, it's kind of open, not gonna lie, but I mean, let's see. Let's see. Their advance was limited. On the 15th of August, only 341st Battalion with three T 34 tanks resisted the Turkish advance, while the rest of the 12th Tactical Group retreated to Larnaca. By evening, Turkish forces entered Famagusta. The Turkish 28th Division advanced 6 kilometers in the western sector on that day as well. On August 16th, the Turks reached Morfu and Limnitis. Thus, the aim of the Attila II offensive was achieved. Turkey's campaign in Cyprus led to the occupation of 40% of the island. The island was divided by the so-called Green Line. Greek refugees, amounting to 160,000 people, left for the Greek-controlled parts of Cyprus, while Turkish refugees moved to the part controlled by Turkey. During the war, the Turks lost up to 3,500 men, while Greek losses amounted to 6,000 men. Subsequently, the Turks declared the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus which is not recognized by the international community. To this day, Cyprus remains divided, despite numerous attempts to reach an agreement. The videos in full 3D are extremely difficult, expensive and time-consuming to make, so when Wargaming came to us with an offer to try out World of Tanks and sponsor this video, we happily agreed, since the topic of the video and the genre of the game have so many similarities. I'll go ahead. Okay, guys, go ahead and end it right there. So yeah, just kind of crazy thing about, and um, obviously, uh, just another example of a, a 20th century uh, war that we fought that was after uh, World War Two. That obviously, because you know, now in this conflict that we're in right now, everybody likes to go back to World War Two. But in, you know, in reality, you know, Europe was having a, a still a lot of different little small wars here and there that could easily um, coalesce just like that. And but in any case, so um, let's I'll digress. Uh, in case so, thank you guys again for joining me on my on this episode. Say peace out to Winston. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out.